Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the Ranchers Thursday Lunchtime Series. Uh, we are excited to have you back again, and I think we've got a great topic, very applicable topic to um, for a variety of reasons on, on controlling cost um, on this long, hot summer day. So with that, uh, Dr. Lawman, do you want to uh, give a little bit of a, an intro? Sure, Dave Lawman, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist. Uh, Dr. Ray, thank you for agreeing uh, to help us with this topic today. We, we did have uh, Dr. Gillum scheduled to do this, but uh, things just, just so happened to turn out that this wound up landing in the middle of his family vacation due to circumstances beyond our control. So thank you very much for, mm -hmm. for, for being willing to present here for us today. Dr. Beck, are you still on with us? I am. So Dr. Beck and Dr. Ray know each other, of course, from the University of Arkansas. So uh, Dr. Beck, of course, is one of our extension uh, beef cattle specialists as well. And if I remember the schedule right, Dr. Beck is on next week. You're, you're on tap next week, right, Dr. Beck? Yes, that's right. All right. So uh, don't miss that as far as protein sources and what are the options to uh, reduce cost with those, particularly as we uh, continue to battle the drought and uh, go in into the fall and winter. Uh, I, I should probably mention my name too. I'm Dr. Rosalind Biggs. I am a beef cattle extension specialist housed within the College of Veterinary Medicine, and uh, I, we're excited to have you. So you've uh, probably had an, enough intro this far. This far, um, I'll have Dr. Ray. If you'll bring up your slides, I'll just give mm -hmm. a little bit of insight uh, about about you to our listeners today. We've already got a Go Hogs Go in the chat, so we've got some got some Arkansas fans with us today. Um, Dr. Eva Ray is a postdoctoral research associate for the University of Arkansas Experiment Station, as well as a livestock parasitologist with the Animal Science Department. And she provides producers with in-depth data um, across all things uh, parasites and uh, offers recommended treatment strategies as well as consultations. So uh, uh, we are looking forward to, to what you have to share with us today, Dr. Ray, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about why, um, whether it does or not to pay, it, does it pay to deworm your cattle? Um, I think by the end of the presentation, you will agree with me that it does pay to deworm, uh, but we're going to look at how. So a lot of the common questions I get from my Arkansas producers is, when do I deworm? Uh, what's the best dewormer to use? Should I even deworm at all? Um, and in order to answer these questions, we have to look at how the farm is managed, how the operation are managed, how those animals um, are managed, the production status, um, what drugs are typically used, all of these things um, in order to answer that question. But the ultimate purpose of deworming is to increase your income and give your cattle a better quality of life. So anytime or when you're deciding if you should use a dewormer and what dewormer to use, um, this should be in your in your mind. You know, you want to increase your profits and increase the quality of, quality of life for your animals. Um, so, why are worms so important? Um, worm burdens affect every level of production, um, which means it affects your total profits. Um, worm burdens can affect how our cows eat, um, how often they eat, how, how well they, they chew their food, um, which also affects how well they uh, convert food so foodstuffs into nutrients for themselves. So it affects their conversion rates, which leads to uh, lighter animals, um, less efficient animals. Uh, worm burdens can also increase the incidence of secondary illnesses, which means you have to use more antibiotics for things like respiratory diseases, foot problems, um, eye problems, all of these things that you have to pay more money for antibiotics to fix typically are driven by 
the presence of worms. So the immune system is just so overwhelmed with trying to take care of these worm burdens that it's kind of uh, all of these other illnesses, all these other pathogens have a um, opportunity to take hold when they normally wouldn't. Um, worm burdens also affect the reproduction efficiency of our animals, especially our female uh, our replacement animals, more, more importantly. Um, I have some graphs on these right here. So this graph shows the changes in the eating patterns of our cattle. Um, on the left over here uh, is minutes grazing per day, how long these animals graze in a day. The, the black bar is the treated animals, the red bar is the untreated animals. Um, so the treated animals graze for about 47 minutes longer throughout the day uh, versus untreated animals. Um, on top of that, over here on the right, we have these two bars. GJM means grazing jaw movements, uh, just means how well they chewed their food. Uh, so the treated animals chewed for about two, had about 34 more chews every 10 minutes versus the untreated animals. So not only were the treated animals grazing longer throughout the day and consuming more forage, they were also chewing their food more efficiently, thus creating a more efficient digest, digestion process. Um, so they didn't have to spend as much time regurgitating and rechewing their foodstuffs. Um, so also, Controlling worms, um, so this graph shows how controlling worms reduces the incidence of antibiotics given. Uh, these were animals that were, uh, these meds were given during feedlot time. Um, over here on the right is the percentage of treated animals. So this first bar here on the, the far left, this 2.5% treated, these animals were treated both on pasture with safeguard and at the feedlot with, with, with safeguard. On pasture, these animals were treated at three different times. So these animals um, with a low incidence of antibiotics given to them um, were, were treated four different times versus over here on the right, the 13.8% of them that were treated with antibiotics these animals were neither treated on pasture or at the feedlot. So they had a much higher incidence of uh, much higher parasite burdens, thus um, an increase in secondary illnesses. Now, something you should note, um, these first two groups here were both treated on pasture three different times. So. When the animals were weaned, they were put on pasture. This is a very stressful time in the animal's life. Um, their immune system is not fully developed during this time. So giving them deworming treatments when the parasite pressure is highest helped them to live a healthier life in the long run. This graph shows the um, reproductive progress of replacement heifers. Um, so in this graph, the black bar is the untreated animals and are the untreated animals and the clear bar are the treated animals. So at the uh, at first estrus, the treated animals were 30, about a month younger versus the untreated animals. Um, not only were they younger, but they were about 11 pounds heavier um, in treated versus untreated. Um, on top of those two things, the conception rate, uh, they had an 11% higher conception rate at first for estrus. So they were younger, heavier, and had a higher um, conception rate just, in the, just by deworming these, these replacement animals. So, um, Taking care of your worm burdens and your young replacements um, can lead to a better, uh, to, to a more efficient overall reproduction system. So this graph shows the effect of um, drug resistance on the average daily gain in feedlot cattle. Uh, so over here on the left uh, is the percent fecal egg count reduction. So this just means um, the percentage of worm eggs that were reduced in the fecal content. 
and that is the striped bar here on the left. Over here on the right are the average daily gains uh, and the clear bar represents them. So the two, the two uh, groups over here on the left, the control animals, which were left untreated, and these animals that were given ivermectin, um, which essentially were left untreated. Um, and this should be um, a takeaway here, uh, where if you give a drug that is not a, uh, that is not working and is not killing worms, you might as well be pouring your product on the ground. Um, so just you know, figuring out what worm what dewormers are working on your operation is essential. Um, over here on the right, two drugs were used that were um, that were very effective. The RICO, RICO bendazole, uh, this, this study was done in Argentina. RICO bendazole is not available in the United States, but it's in the same drug class as Safeguard, Oxbendazole, uh, Valbazin. So it's a white wormer. And it had a very good, uh, an, an excellent reduction in egg output. Uh, the last bar here is Levamazole. It's a combination of Prohibit, which is available here, and ricobendazole, and they had a 100% reduction in um, egg out, parasite egg output. And the animals that were given an effective treatment had about a quarter of a pound increase uh, in their average daily gain. Um, so you get much heavier animals, much more efficient animals, much more efficient growth if you take care of the parasitisms. So eliminating your internal parasite control, which means not deworming at all, negatively impacts your break-even selling point by 34%. This means that you could lose an average of $165 per animal by not deworming. And that doesn't sound like a lot if you're just looking at a couple animals, but if you're selling hundreds of animals a year, year after year after year, that really adds up quickly. Um, and just to drive these points home one more time um, on how these worms affect our animals, they decrease their, their forage intake, they create a poor appetite, um, which leads to lowered weight gains and lowered milk production. You get a poor body, score, uh, body condition score, you get uh, poor reproductive efficiency. And all of these worms that are in our animals, with the exception of the tapeworm, physically eat blood and or tissue of our animals, which equates to protein. So all of this protein loss um, can be significant, especially on operations where parasitisms are high and, and producers are not deworming. Um, a fully functional, competent immune system requires uh, a lot of protein. Uh, so the loss of this protein results in a incompetent immune system, um, as well as the, the immune system that is functioning, fighting off all of these parasitisms. So you just have this overtaxed, fatigued immune system, um, which allows the introduction of secondary illnesses um, and more, more antibiotics having to be used to control these secondary illnesses. Um, and again, you get lowered feed conversions, which you have a less efficient gastrointestinal system. The, the, it's, and so the animals aren't uh, converting the nutrients like they should. So the worms of concern, um, cattle routinely get all of these worms uh, listed here, plus some, uh, they're not um, evenly distributed throughout everywhere. Each, each operation is unique to what worms are present and what what proportions of worms are present. Um, but the three that are pretty pretty much on every operation that we look at, um, and it, it, it not this is not singular to Arkansas. So you have your, your cuperiids. Uh, you have about three or four different species that affect our cattle. Um, and I would say they're in 98% of the, 99% of the samples that we look at, um, at least one species of, of a cuperia. There's good news and bad news with cuperia. With cuperia, um, good news is they don't take a lot individually. They don't take a lot from our our cattle. Um, they 
don't, they're not heavy feeders, um, but bad news is their populations inside of the animal can become substantial uh, and they, the drug resistance uh, that, they're sh the, that they're starting to show is starting to become significant. Um, and, they, and again, they're located on just about every operation. The brown stomach worm um, it used to be ostertages. So it used to be really important. Um, and then ivermectin was introduced to the market and it was when it was still effective, um, ivermectin kind of took care of ostertagia, but as ivermectin began to fail, ostertagia began to come back. Um, so it's, it's, it's starting to become an issue. Um, and I know that Oklahoma has a lot of uh, imported cattle from, uh, from other areas. So um, ostertagia is a big one that, that we deal with. Um, the barber pole worm, Hymonchus, it's, any, if any of you own small ruminants, um, you're very familiar with Hymonchus. It's, it, it does affect cattle, just not to the degree that it does small ruminants. Um, it is resistant to a lot of drugs that are commonly used, um, but it, it's not as um, a dire situation in our cattle versus our small ruminants. Um, Nematodirus, Esophagostomum, those, these two worms can be important um, and they are important on specific operations. So nematodirus is important um, on dairy operations, backgrounding operations, anywhere where you have young calves that are on the same pastures year after year. So you have a new group of calves come in every year and they use those same pastures. Uh, that's where you can get into nematodirus issues. Esophagostomum can be important, um, though it, it rarely is, and it's, it's singular to specific operations. Uh, same with Trichuris, it can be important, but it's typically isolated to individual operations. Liver flukes, um, in Arkansas, we have some areas where liver, liver flukes are, very, are pretty bad. Um, in Oklahoma, your environment, your arid, hot, dry environment is not really conducive for the fluke life cycle. So I would wager that because you fluke liver flukes require uh, standing water and mud snails to complete their life cycle. So if you don't have standing water on your in your pastures, you you probably don't have flukes unless you import animals from areas where flukes are a concern. So uh, coastal, coastal areas, so um, Florida, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, some from Arkansas, Michigan, areas with low-lying pastures that are in standing water uh, that may be an issue for you. Tapeworms, tapeworms are at the very bottom of my list of concern. Um, they're, they're found just about on every operation. And typically they don't do a lot of harm because they don't physically eat our animals. They can cause uh, animals to be smaller or, or lighter um, due to the nutrients that they steal. Typically, you know, and it may be more important in backgrounding operations where you're trying to, to maximize growth, um, but typically tapeworms are, are not an issue and are not very important. Um, so there's kind of, there's sort of a misconception of areas, states that, that are prairie or desert don't have parasites in our cattle. And that's not entirely untrue and it's not entirely true. You, you still have parasites, you just don't have as many parasites. Um, your animal or, animals are spread out on a lot of acreage, um, so you're not getting concentrated um, infectious larvae on pastures, but you do still have parasites, especially um, operations that import cattle. So this, this graph or this table here uh, is some data that our lab did in 2014. Um, we were just looking, uh, we looked at 282 fecal samples from Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas, and 99% of them were positive um, for strongyle eggs. Strongyle eggs is a group of 
So strongyles are a group of, of round worms whose eggs all look the same under the microscope, which pretty much encompasses most of our cattle worms. So you can't really differentiate the eggs. Um, so, but 99% but of them were positive for uh, strongyles, for, for parasites. Um, and they had a pretty high fecal, uh, EPG is eggs per gram. That's how we, um, that's the unit we use for fecal egg count measurements. So the eggs per gram mean on these animals were, was uh, 362 eggs per gram. A high egg count for a calf uh, is, you know, two, 300. That's, that's pretty decent for a calf. So these were pretty, pretty high egg counts coming in. Um, so this just is purely to show you that you do have parasitisms in Oklahoma. So how do the worms get so bad? Um, first off, not knowing the degree of infection, not knowing what parasites are present, um, not knowing what they're doing to your animals. Uh, the, all of this, this blindness can lead to a situation where worms are really decimating your animals and you're really losing a lot of money. You just can't see it uh, because animals are such big creatures. Uh, and it's, it's really hard to see uh, five pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds lost on an animal from, from parasitisms. Uh, not treating at all. Uh, now on, on some operations, this might be ideal. For most operations, uh, tr some treatments are necessary. Not treating at all just kind of lets the parasitisms go uh, unchecked and out, get, out of, get out of hand really quickly. Using ineffective products um, is essentially the same as not treating at all. However, using ineffective products drives drug resistance on your operation. So every time you use a product that's not working and not killing the, the parasites, all of the surviving parasites are putting out drug resistant eggs. Um, onto your pasture. So you're, you're contaminating your pasture with drug resistant worms. Um, using proper products improperly, uh, you want to deliberately apply your products to your animals. Um, a pour on is a pour on, it's not a splash on. I know when, when we're working 100 plus animals, the last few animals that you're applying the pour on to, it can get you know repetitive and, and tiresome, cumbersome, but you really want to do your best to apply the product properly. And this also ap applies to storage of your products. So if you leave your, you use a dewormer and you put it in the sunlight or leave it in the heat. So right now, any, being outside in the barn might be too hot on the product. So heat and sunlight degrades the dewormer, the, the drug chemicals. So it's not working as um, efficiently for the next time you use it, uh, which can drive drug, drug resistance. If you uh, use a pro product improperly or store it improperly, that can drive drug re resistance on your place. Um, giving unnecessary treatment. So I really try to push something called targeted selective treatments, meaning that you identify the animals that need treatment and only give it to those animals. You don't want to give blanket treatments uh, or treat everybody in the herd just because, uh, you know, out of convenience rather than diagnosis. Um, for the most part, cattle age out of their parasites at about two, two and a half years old. So I would say 90 plus percent of healthy, mature mama cows don't require treatment. They just don't get the, the high enough egg counts to warrant treatment. Um, and and it, the drug doesn't necessarily pay for itself through the production gains because their parasitisms are so low. Now, um, th points three, four, and five, these all drug drive drug resistance, which equates to dollars lost. When do you give these dewormers? Um, you ideally, you wanna get treat when there is a challenge. Again, the targeted selective treatment. You wanna identify those animals that need a treatment uh, and then treat only those animals and then and leave the, the rest untreated. Um, ideally, you want to confirm them with fecal egg counts. Uh, this isn't always possible for 
uh, folks with a lot of acreage or labor limitations. Um, but ideally, you don't want to blindly give dewormer dewormers anymore uh, because so few, you know, drug resistance is is skyrocketing in our cattle. We're kind of dwindling down the products that are still effective, and we really want to protect the longevity of those products. So blanket treating and exposing exposing these parasite populations to a drug when not necessary. Um, is not necessarily helping that cause. So we need to identify the animals that need treatment, ideally identify the animals that need treatment and treat only those. You also wanna target specific seasons and production periods, um, which I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Um, so some of these weren't, so Ostertagia is a seasonal worm. Um, the brown, brown stomach worm is a seasonal worm. The barber pole worm is a seasonal worm. So you wanna identify, so it, it really helps to identify the worms that are on your place. And that way it helps to better tailor your, tr your treatments um, for those specific parasite populations. Um, and more than anything, you want to use an effective dewormer. Um, you don't want to waste your money on a product that's not working. Um, you, when you use a product, because they're, you know, these these dewormers are not inexpensive, especially when you have hundreds of animals that you're trying to treat. Um, so you you want to use a dewormer that is effective, and the only way to do that is doing a fecal egg count reduction test. Um, the rules for the fecal egg count reduction test. You want to take a fecal egg count before you give a treatment, and then you want to take a fecal egg count from that same animal or those same animals two weeks after you give treatment. Um, so that way, and there's just, just a small calculation, just some cowboy math, um, and you can calculate how well your dewormer is working on your operation. And I will say, having worked with a lot of Arkansas producers, it is it, it's almost more, it's almost better to know what's not working on your place than what is working on your place. Or I guess I said that wrong. It's better to know what not to use than to know what to use. Because if, you, if you're using a product that's not working, you're wasting your money on the product, you're driving drug resistance further on your place. Plus uh, worms tend to have a compensatory response um, to surviving a deworming treatment, meaning the worms that survive the treatment take more from our animals, they put out more eggs, they reproduce faster. Um, so we're honestly using a, an ineffective dewormer is creating a much worse situation than, uh, even, than even not using a dewormer at all. So, I'm going to give you some time frames on the ideal time periods to deworm your treatments. I'm not saying that you should, you know, every year you you need to treat based on on uh, these these time periods I'm about to give you. Um, but ideally, this is if you're going to give a treatment, this is when you want to target it. So, mama cows, uh, you want to target about 30 days before calving. Or if or intake, um, anytime you get a new animal on your place, you want to evaluate their worm burdens so you're not um, seeding down your pastures with resistant worms. Um, deworming mama cows about 30 days before calving will create better feed conversions, uh, situations for better feed conversions, which creates higher milk yields, which leads to larger calves and a quicker return to estrus. You do, however, see more of an impact on your production, um, on your production gains with your first and second year heifers um, and on your milking operations. So on your, on your first and second year heifers, they're, they're younger animals. They're still, they're, they haven't quite aged out of their parasite, their parasitisms yet. They're having a little bit more trouble. <clears throat> the first, first couple of um, parturitions are, are harder on those animals. So you're just kind of giving them um, the best opportunity. Now in milking operations, this you do see gains um, from deworming your, your, your mamas before calving. Again, typically you never need to treat healthy mature mama cows. So your calves, you wanna target as close to weaning as you can um, or at intake. 
this is again, I've, I spoke about this before, this is a very stressful time. They're having a huge diet change. Their immune system is taxed. It's, it's not fully uh, developed. So any help that you can give them to ward off their parasitisms during this time period, you will see the benefits later uh, in their, their entire lives. I mean, if, if they're replacement heifers, you'll see healthier animals throughout their lives. If, you, if they're uh, feedlot animals, you'll, you'll be selling larger animals to, to the feedlot when, it, when it's time to sell them. Um, so lower parasite burdens, again, you get better feed conversions, you get significant increases in weight gains, um, and you have fewer secondary uh, infections. Again, uh, you just get a healthier overall animal. You give them a better start to their, to their life. Your replacement animals, uh, you wanna target the spring and the fall. Uh, this will target both of those seasonal, all of the seasonal aspects of parasite burdens um, and, and it intake. So if you're, if you're buying replacement heifers from someone else, you, you wanna again, evaluate the parasite burden that you're bringing onto your place. Um, Deworming your replacements. We talked about this earlier. You'll have younger, heavier, and more uh, younger and heavier animals, and they'll be, they'll be more successful at the first uh, heat, at their first heat and service. Um, this will lead to higher milk yields, heavier calves, and a quicker return to estrus. So, um, lots of benefits. Now, your bulls. Um, bulls have a little harder time. Males tend to have a harder time with worms than females. Females have a more efficient gastrointestinal tract, uh, gastrointestinal immune system than males do. Um, so males tend to have a harder time with worms. Plus, bulls are not the best at taking care of themselves. So they're continuously distracted. And if they're close to any females throughout the year at all, they're just, you know, they're walking the fence and they're not taking care of themselves like they should. And this is especially true during the breeding season, which can create um, inc inc instances of higher parasitism. So uh, target you wanna target the spring and fall with your bulls, plus about a month before you turn them out, uh, just to kind of give them a boost for the, the time that they're gonna be taxed. The dewormers, so what dewormers should you use? So over here on the left are the drugs. Um, over here on the right are the application methods. And both lists are listed in my preference for them. Um, both, so the drugs are listed by um, effectiveness that, I, that we've seen in, on our, in our lab. Uh, the white wormers, so this is Safeguard, Oxfindazole, Valbazin. These are really good products that are still working um, in, our, in our cattle. I assume it's because they only they come in oral formulations um, and it takes a few more minutes to work animals if you're using an oral um, application, oral formulation. Um, but we have had, we still, every time we do a drug trial, um, we throw a white wormer in there and it's still the best, the best drug that, that it, we used to in the comparison. Um, but the next one I like is Prohibit. Um, it comes in a powder formulation or powder and you suspend it in water. It's also an oral. Um, it's, it's not a broad spectrum, so it has limited use, um, but because, and it's been around on the US market since the 1940s, I believe. Um, and it, it, it's a little bit toxic, so you have to get um, a correct weight on the animal. You can't eyeball the weight. Uh, you have to get it, you know, just right, the dosage just right, but it is also a very good product. Uh, Chlorcelon is the flucicide. Um, it typically comes in an avermectin, in a combination avermectin product. So um, Ivamec Plus, Dormectin Plus, um, any, typically anything with a plus on it is, has chlorcelon in it. And that, that um, acts as your uh, flucicide. Uh, Cydectin. Now, Cydectin is in the same subclass as ivermectin and aprinomectin, um, but it it's formulated a little bit different differently, and it gets hung up in the fat a little bit longer. So it has a little bit more of a persistent activity um, than its ivermectin counterparts. So it still has a little bit of e efficacy. Um, it depends. You know, each 
operation is a little bit different. Um, it depends on how much avermectin resistance uh, that farm has. Um, so when you when you get resistance to ivermectin and other avermectins, because cydectin is in that same drug class, that uh, sub it's a sub class of macrocyclic lactones. But because they're all macrocyclic lactones, um, they they there's some cross uh, resistance there. A prenomectin long range. Um, I have a lot of producers that want to use this in their mama cows, and that's never a good idea. Um, you really only want to use long range in calves that are leaving your place eventually. You don't want to keep animals, use long range in animals that you're going to keep on your operation. So backgrounding, feedlot animals, that, that's, that's fine. But if you're not in your in your replacement animals, you don't want to use long range. Um, it just has so much potential for resistance to build up because of the life of the drug. Ivermectin, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say because ivermectin is um, so uh, widely available and widely used that ivermectin resistance is pretty ubiquitous across, uh, especially the Southern US. Um, most, most places, most operations, on most operations, ivermectin is no longer effective. And there is a difference in the pioneer versus generic formulation. So we have, I don't know, 10 or 15 generics, generic ivermectin um, on, our, on our shelves. Um, the pioneer product is Ivamec. Um, the, what we think of as Ivamec, uh, but it, that's the Pioneer product. And the generics, we've used generics um, and just about every drug trial we've ever done, a generic Avermectin, and they've never worked as good as the Pioneer. They, they just don't work as well. So if you are gonna buy Ivermectin, you wanna buy Ivamec, you wanna buy that Pioneer product because it is more effective. Um, for the application methods, again, these are listed in my preference for them uh, for use. I like orals. Um, you're taking a little bit more time per animal, but it's, the, I think, especially with cattle, um, or the oral products are the ones that are working the best. So if you can take a few more minutes per animal, uh, it might behoove you to use a white worm or, or prohibit. Um, I do like injectables as well because you're getting 100% of that dose in that animal. Uh, you do have to worry about injection site, site issues, abscesses, things like that. Um, and also the drugs that are in the injectable form um, are not working as they should. So I do like the, the application method, um, but the drugs that come in the injectable form have limited effectiveness. Um, porons, I would say porons are probably the most widely used formulation um, in the United States, probably everywhere. It's just the easiest way to, to apply it. Um, you just pour it on it. However, I think I mentioned this before, it's a pour on and not a splash on. Um, if you don't get 100% of that product between the shoulders and the hips on the back line of that animal, you run the risk of underdose of misdosing that animal. Um, and another thing with porons, if you treat one animal with poron, you have to treat every animal within a tongue's length of that animal. So they for, of the treated animal. So uh, cattle groom each other. So if you only treat a few animals in the pen with with a poron dewormer. Uh, the grooming the grooming behavior is going to remove a lot of that product from the end and everybody's going to get a little bit underdosed. So the rule with pour on is you, if you treat one animal in a pen, you have to treat, treat everybody in the pen. Uh, extended release, we talked a little bit about that. It's not my favorite formula um, or application. Um, in certain situations, it is, it is good, um, but for most of our cattle production situations, I, I would lean away from long range. Uh, feed additives and blocks. Um, it's never really, as a general rule, it's never really a good idea to let animals dose themselves um, unless you have 
an animal in a stall with its own feed pan where you can see that it eats 100% of the dose that is, that is required for it. Um, it's not really a good idea because, you know, cattle have a hierarchy. Some, you know, those at the, at the lower rank may not get dosed at all. Um, so it's, it's never really a good idea to let them treat themselves. Okay. Uh, so how can you, how can I develop a successful parasite control program? Um, I am a huge proponent of conducting regular fecal egg counts. It's really incredible how much information you get back just from fecal egg counts. You can identify um, the carrier, the animals that are the carriers of all the worms. So there's a general rule in paras parasitology, 20% of your animals are gonna carry 80% of your parasites. So through fecal egg counts, you can identify that 20% that has all the parasites call them all and get them off of your place and you've taken care of 80% of your worm problem. Um, and, you know, getting 100% of your population is ideal. However, it's not always feasible. So if you get a random 15, 20% of, of your total population, that will give you a really good idea of what's going on. Um, regular is kind of a subjective term. Um, it just means as often as you are able, um, Monthly or bi-monthly for a few grazing seasons is ideal. Um, it's that's the best option. It's not necessarily feasible for most people. Seasonally, co seasonal collections is a good idea, um, or are a good is so. And it, you can either target all four seasons or you can target the spring and the fall. Um, but you want to just kind of try to catch the the seasonal parasite parasite burdens. And at the very least, um, everyone should be doing at least once a year fecal egg counts. Um, you really, it's really hard to manage your parasite burdens on your place um, if you don't know how severe they are or what parasite species are even located on your place. So fecal egg counts are very important. Um, testing the effectiveness of your dewormers is also important. Ideally, you wanna do this every time they're used. This is not necessarily feasible for most people. Um, so, you know, a yearly fecal egg count reduction test will help you keep a better idea of how well your drugs are still working. Um, again, 100% of your population, 100% uh, fecal samples from your population, fecal samples from 100% of your population is ideal, but a random 15, 20% will work. The only caveat there being you, if you have to take samples from the same animals, pre-treatment and post-treatment. So if, you, if it's a random 20% the first time, be sure to write those tag numbers down um, and, and label the, the fecal samples. That way, two weeks later, after you've given the drug, you can pull samples from those same animals and calculate the, the uh, reduction in egg output. If you do different animals each time, um, it, it won't work out that it, and the calculation won't work and it, it, it'll be flawed. So you have to use the same animals um, for pre-treatment and post-treatment um, sampling. So uh, another way to, con to control parasites um, is implement, implement management strategies. Um, now, management strategies are not as important, as I've stated before, not as important as they are in the small ruminant world. But because uh, in, in the cattle industry, you know, our drugs are starting to be ticked off one by one due to resistance levels. So we we as cattlemen are eventually going to have to shift to, to management control for parasites versus drug control for parasites. So the more we shift this way now, um, the longer it extends the life of our dewormers. Um, it will not be such a huge shift in labor and management practices when drugs are rendered useless. Uh, and there are, no, there are no new drugs coming out. Um, what we have is basically what we have for the foreseeable future. So we really have to protect the few drugs that are still working by supplementing our parasite control 
with management practices. Uh, we, this can be done by grazing and forage management. Um, so 90% of the worm population is on pasture. There's only, at any given time, only 10% of the total worm population is inside of our animals. So all of the parasite pressure comes from our pasture. So um, it stands to reason that intensive grazing management and forage management can help mitigate um, reinfections and parasite pressure from pasture. Um, rotational grazing is one that I push hard. I know it's not feasible for um, operations with you know huge amount of acreage, but if you can rotationally graze based, based on forage height, um, that would be ideal for parasite control. So the majority, I, I think 80, 85% of all of the infective larvae on pasture are in the bottom three inches of your forage. So if you rotate your animals off of, off, you know, to a new pasture at four inches, when, the, when that forage gets down to four inches, then, then you're reducing the amount of contact your cattle have with those infective larvae. Um, so once again, reducing parasite pressure from pasture. Um, and there are forage type differences. So native grasses and prairie type grasses, you can't graze those down as, as heavily as say Bermuda grass. Um, and so having different forage types where you have to, to rotate your animals um, based on, you know, to, to keep the, the forages alive and healthy, that helps again, kind of in the rotating based on forage height, but it's um, uh, forage type also that, that plays a role. So, so any kind of forage management, uh, grazing management really does help. Um, you can tailor, you, you have to tailor your program, your parasite program um, to your specific operation. Every operation is unique in a myriad of ways. So. Uh, what type of production you have? Is it a cow calf? Is it a fat grounding? Is it a milking operation? Um, what types of worm burdens you have? How severe those worm burdens are? Uh, what resistance levels? Everybody uses different drugs on every operation um, at different rates. Uh, so you have different levels of resistance. How much land and labor you have available? Not everyone has the access to, of, to land to be able to rotationally graze. Um, not everybody has enough labor to be able to do it as well. The available facilities, fencing is an issue. All of these things make every operation unique and you have to figure out, take, take these pieces of the puzzle and see what will fit on your operation. Um, because th these are, you know, you don't have to do exactly what your neighbor does and you don't have to do exactly what I'm telling you, um, you know, verbatim, but you can take a version of that, apply it to your operation um, and have better parasite control. So does it pay to deworm your cattle? Yes, but the only way to be certain is to do these following things. Um, if you want to really sit down and calculate um, how much money has being, is being lost or how much money is being gained from parasite, from you know, uh, changing your parasite control protocols, uh, you need to do these three things. So you want to accurately weigh your animals. Um, you wanna take beginning weights and end weights and your beginning weights can be um, intake weights, weaning weights, just any weights before you give your deworming treatment. And your end weights are anytime after your deworming treatments, ideally a month or two after you give treatments um, to, to let, you know, see a little bit of difference in weight gain. Um, but this can be when you're selling your calves at the cell barn, at the feedlot, when, wherever you can get end weights, um, that way you can have before treatment weights and after treatment weights. Um, you want to accurately just administer your dewormers. Again, a pour on is a pour on, not a splash on. If you're giving an oral product, you wanna make sure you get 100% of that product inside of the animal. Same thing with the injection. So it's, uh, you have to accurately give the proper dosage. And then you wanna conduct a fecal egg count reduction test in order to assess the effectiveness of your chosen dewormer. Um, again, I'll harp on this again, you take pre-treatment fecal egg counts and then two week post-treatment fecal egg counts 
uh, and do a small calculation and you can calculate the percent um, reduction in worm and in, in egg output from the worms. Now calculating your profits gained or lost from deworming, like actually sitting down and calculating does require having a set of control animals that are left untreated. I've never had a producer take me up on this in Arkansas um, who wants to leave a set of calves untreated. But if you're curious and you wanna know how much you're gaining um, or how much you were losing uh, by your old deworming treatment or regimen or protocol, uh, you'll need to leave a set of control animals and then calculate it from there. And this is my information. Um, you can call or email any, this is my office number at the bottom. Um, call or email anytime. I'm always available to talk about parasites. Um, and that's all I got. There you go. Excellent. Thank you, Eva. We have a few questions. Um, I'm going to start with one from Brian Frecking uh, asking about the Argentina study. Um, use two products. Um, so is that something to consider when bringing in animals to a herd, such as replacement heifers or herd bulls, et cetera? Um, now, there are some parasitologists who are big proponents of um, combination deworming. It, it honestly depends. Um, so with, with sheep and goats, I would say we only have maybe two products that partially work. So I would say never use combination products with cattle because we do have a little more, uh, a few more products that work, um, that, that work well, then it's, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but let me go back to that slide. See if I can go back to it. Here it is. Um, so so, so this last group was prohibit and the white wormer mixed together and you got a hundred percent reduction. Well, in just the white wormer class or group, you got a 96% reduction. So this group really didn't get that much better, statistically that much better um, reduction in egg output, but They've exposed all of these worm, you know, they, they ran the risk of exposing these, this population of, of worms to both prohibit and a white wormer. So now, so if, if any of these worms survived, um, which they, you know, they may have, it may just have knocked out egg production, which is the case in some, in some um, instances, um, all of the surviving worms coming out of this, these animals will now be resistant to benzamidazoles and levamazole. So two different drug classes. So it's not, I don't wanna say don't do it, but if you're using an effective product and you're testing the effectiveness of your dewormers and you know that Safeguard has a 90%, 96% reduction in egg output, it really, so to me, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to use another drug at the same time because when you're spending more money, um, I kind of categorize that as an unnecessary treatment because, you know, the this, this single drug was working great. Um, is there really a need to add a second drug? Now, not all drugs are 90%, 96% effective. Um, so it, it's, and I know that's not really an answer, but there's, there, there aren't really many straight answers for it. I don't like using combination dewormers. A lot of my peers, parasitology peers, do like using combination dewormers. Um, I just don't think it's a great practice to get my producers in the habit of, of doing, um, because, because really eventually within the next decade or so, we're gonna have, multi-drug failure in our cattle. Um, it's it's gonna be, I mean, it's it's not gonna be as bad as the small ruminants probably ever, the small ruminant industry, but we will see a significant increase in drug resistance. And so anything we can do now to mitigate that, you know, prolong that for, you know, that scenario, the better off we'll be. Um, does, that does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that does. Okay. Um, have one um, 
Greg Hartman has a comment and I'd like maybe nice to see a video of this. He said, we found out by accident that porons are flammable. Maybe you should do this the last when working cattle. Yeah. Greg Hartman is not the only one that has ex had that experience um, themselves. Uh, I, I had <laughs> I had a client in practice that was uh, trying to oh, rush things a little bit, uh, put the pour on on. We went to brand and um, had, had a very similar experience, it sounds like, as Ms. Hartman. So uh, safety first, and I appreciate Dr. Ray's <laughs> comments about thinking about welfare, and that certainly fits into, fits into that category, so. Yes. We also have two questions. Um, I guess we had two typing the same question at the same time. Um, uh, did I understand you correctly that we do not need to treat cattle over two years of age? And then the second question was, in Louisiana, where there's predominantly liver flukes, does that also include flucicides? Um, so to answer the first one, honestly, if your animal, if your mature cows over two, two and a half years old are healthy, and stress-free and just happy cows, 90 plus percent of them don't need to be treated. Uh, we rarely get mama cow samples in that need, that require treatment. So for example, my mom hasn't treated her mama cows in 15 years, I don't think. And every time I do fecal samples on them, they're minimal. So um, that, I don't say, well, I don't want to say that's a hard line rule, but that's a, I mean, it's, it's pretty typical. Um, and as far as the liver flukes one, um, is that the Austin pain? Yes. Um, even for liver flukes. I think the question is, it, it, we've, we've got folks from really kind of a, a broad spectrum of states. Mm -hmm that are joining today. So if we're in a state uh, like Louisiana that has fluke issues historically, mm -hmm. and obviously Arkansas can be sub, you know, subjected to that as well, where do we, what are our options? Do we need to think about on these mama cows if we're not gonna deworm for other internal parasites, where do flukes fit in that mix? So flukes, um... Flukes can become a huge issue, especially on operations where you have standing water. Louisiana, I imagine, has flukes on just about every operation. Um, there are no drugs that kill fluke larvae. Um, so you have, there, there's just an, uh, an adulticide. So you'll have to have multiple treatments. So you'll treat um, your animals once, once they've been confirmed to have liver flukes, you'll treat them once, wait a couple of weeks, treat again. And honestly, waiting another two weeks and treating again wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, what you're doing is you're waiting for those larval flukes to become adults. So now the drug is effective against them. As far as pasture management, um, you really want to try, and I know this really isn't feasible in a lot of, of situations, but you really want to try to fence off your standing water. Don't let your animals have access to um, grass that is growing out of water, uh, rabbits and white-tailed deer drive liver fluke infections. Um, so keeping them off your place is recommended. I don't know how anyone keeps deer and rabbits off of your operation. Um, routine surveillance of liver for liver flukes, fecal egg counts, you can identify flukes in um, fecal egg counts. Um, in areas where flukes are heavy, um, I would say routine fecal egg counts just to help you identify those animals. Um, because it, typically fluky animals just kind of look unthrifty, you know, ill thrift and uh, rough coat and no antibiotics are working and dewormers aren't working and nothing really is making them feel, you know, look better. Plus you have standing water in your pasture, you most likely have flukes. So. Um, it's, but, it, but it is really hard to visually identify them. So, so fecal egg counts will help, um, help you stay on top of that. Now, I don't know that there's any way you can completely rid your place of flukes. I haven't heard it yet, if there is. Um, so uh, 
you just kind of have to keep stay on top of it and keep surveillance of them. Excellent. Uh, we have a question since you know fecal egg counts did come up again. Is the fecal egg count test something you have to send off, or can you learn to ID and do on your own farm? Uh, what are the steps in in doing this, and how is it best done by a producer? So. Honestly, so with sheep and goats, because they have such high fecal egg counts, there's kind of a shortcut method called the McMaster's technique, um, where every egg you see is representative of 50 eggs and you don't need a centrifuge or any special lab equipment to do it, uh, just a microscope. But with cattle, because they don't have thousands of eggs per gram, you have to use a centrifuge and, and it really has to be done in a lab. You can do it at home, um, but you have to get, you know, you need a microscope and a centrifuge and a centrifuge is thousands of dollars um, on, at, on discount. So um, honestly, for cattle samples, they need, they need to be sent off. Now, uh, I know the vet school in Oklahoma, I, I'm pretty sure they do fecal sampling um, for producers. And so, our lab, we do, I, I offer free fecal sampling to Arkansas producers. You just have to get me your samples. Um, and and that's that's how a lot of them um, survey all their parasitisms. But typically you send, for cattle, you send it off, um, I would say to the vet school or or something. Um, I don't wanna step on toes. I mean, I, any if you send me samples, I will read them, but um, I don't I don't wanna step on anybody's toes, but um, just sending them off is, is the best way. For Oklahoma and the Oklahoma Animal Disease Diagnostic Laboratory, which is part of the veterinary school, does, does offer fecal egg counts. Oh, and nice. um, while we're continuing to answer questions, I'll put that, that link for those Oklahoma producers. It doesn't have to be necessarily Oklahoma producers, but um, I'll put that link in the, okay. in the chat for folks. That's great. Were there any other questions? How long after deworming uh, do you need to wait before putting cattle to a new pasture to keep that pasture clean? Um, in reality, there's no such thing as a clean pasture. Um, if Unless you've let it rest for five plus years and kept all the deer off of it and kept all the animals off, there are no such things as clean pastures. Um, and I know It's, it's hard. It's also kind of hard to all these answers are kind of nuanced. Um, but the the old so it used to be treat and move to a new pasture. Um, then they said don't do that. But now you just you really want to how soon after you move them is not as important as using an effective dewormer. So if you're using an effective dewormer. You can put, move them anywhere and not worry about it. If you're using a dewormer that is not working, anywhere you, you put them is going to be seeded down with resistant uh, parasites on pasture. So the key to to that, you, you know, basically the answer to that question is you want to use an effective product. So moving them is not an issue. Um, another question: How does the hot and dry weather conditions we're, we have now, uh, and normally in Oklahoma through the summer, uh, how does that affect the worm cycle? So worm, infective larvae on pasture require moisture um, to move around and move, travel up and down the blades of grass. Um, however, when it's dry, you would think that they would be killed off by the dry weather, but they, they burrow down into the ground and under the fecal pads, waiting for a surge of moisture, rainfall and such. Now, dry weather does kill off quite a few, you know, a, a large percentage of the larvae, but there are survivors. Um, and so I don't know about Oklahoma, but yesterday Arkansas finally got a little rain shower. It wasn't much, but it was just enough to wet the ground. And that is enough to stimulate all of those larvae to come back out of the ground and start migrating on the grass again because there's moisture present. So the, the drier weather, they're not as um, present on the, on the blades of grass in the pasture because there's no moisture. Um, but when we get rainfall, any time you get rainfall, you're gonna have an increase in parasite 
uh, larvae on pasture um, because they, they thrive in moisture and they're very reactive. So um, weather does play a big role in um, the life cycle. Um, this is an interesting question I hadn't thought of. Does the time of day affect the fecal egg count on a, uh, as far as a diurnal pattern or is it a continuous um, flow? Not necessarily. Um, now there are some parasites like the whipworm, uh, the entire population inside of the animal will kind of coordinate their egg release. So they will, every, all of the females will dump all their eggs and then there will be a quiescent, you know, couple day period where they're, they don't, don't there's no egg, egg out point put from the whipworms. And then that is, so it's a coordinated dump. Typically with our, um, the parasites we see most often in our cattle, it's, it's pretty even, a pretty even distribution. Um, time of day doesn't matter. Um, now, now flukes, uh, to catch flukes, sometimes you do have to do several fecal samples uh, several days in a row. Um, because you might, because you may not have, but a couple flukes in your animals and you're only taking one gram of feces to, to identify the parasites in them. So in, in it, so, um, taking multiple samples, multiple days in a row is ideal, especially if you suspect your animal has flukes and it's not popping positive in the fecal egg count. So you just want to keep, um, multiple in, in several day period. Another question, if we're using the white oral dewormer, what drug do you recommend for um, external uh, parasites such as flies and lice? So I, I'm a purist. I don't like using dewormers for fly control. Um, it gets us in a lot of trouble with resistance, cross resistance, um, and, it, and it doesn't, it does provide a benefit for the flies, but it's just temporary. Um, so I don't recommend using dewormers, um, organophosphates, uh, or um, pyrethrin or permethrins. Those are the you know the only two things to use. But you can use different application methods. Flies are a whole different ball game, and um, we really need to start doing more research with flies because it's kind of getting out of control. But you really just want to more so alternate application methods. So dust bags, spray on, things like that. You want to alternate those rather than um, use a dewormer. I um, have a question about uh, rotating the products, um, I guess, in different applications during the year or? or... Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me pull that up. Uh, so rotating the drugs, I am a huge proponent of using a drug or a chemical class. So when you rotate drugs, you wanna rotate based on their chemical class, not their trade name. So you don't wanna use um, one gen generic ivermectin that's named this, that's named X, and then this other generic ivermectin is named Y. Those are the same drug. So you want to use completely different drug classes. And I'm a huge proponent of using using a drug until it's no longer effective and then taking it out of rotation and then not using it for several years um, and then maybe three, four, five years down the road, you do a fecal egg count reduction test and test if whether or not that drug is effective or not. Um, so sometimes in, you know, in theory, if you let a drug class rest long enough um, and you come back, you know, for, for enough years, you can come back and use it once it is effective again. So, you know, you know, you want to be sure rotate on drug classes um, and then use a drug until it no longer is effective. Uh, we have one last question and then probably be about time to, to shut down this edition of the Ranchers Thursday. Um, since 90% of the worm larvae are on the pasture, is there any way to, has there been any research in looking at ways to uh, find ways to control the worm population on the pasture without treating the animal? So they're, they're looking at a lot of products. They're looking at, at a lot of bacteria. Um, 
They do have a fungus feed through, it's called Biowarma. It's really big in the, the overseas um, and small ruminant people know a lot about it. Um, it is a it, fungal spores that go on the top of, it's a feed topper and you feed it every day. Uh, the fungal spores travel through the gastrointestinal tract into the fecal pellet or fecal pat on the pasture. And when those, with the nematode eggs, with the worm eggs, and once those eggs begin to hatch, the proteins that are released, the enzymes that are released for, for them to hatch into larvae, it activates the fungus and the fungus physically eats the larvae before it ever becomes to the infected, before it ever becomes infective. Um, it is very expensive. It does work well. You have to use it for a very long time. Um, but honestly, there's there's really there are very few ways to rid your par your pastures of parasites, other than managing your operation in such a way where re you're reducing the contact you your cows have with the parasites, if that makes sense. So grazing at four inches and above will keep you out of 80, 85% of those infective larvae on pasture. So it's, there's not a, a one answer for, for all of this. It's, um, and, and honestly, larvae would survive, larvae survive on pasture way longer than people would be comfortable with knowing. So um, they're, they're very efficient creatures. Well, thank you very much, Eva. That was very enjoyable. Thank you, I appreciate it. And if anybody has questions, um, follow-up questions, or you just email me. I don't, I don't mind at all. So, all right. Well, I think that wraps us up for today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ray, for joining us. And uh, we had probably more questions than we've had in a long time, Dr. Beck. So, uh, I think uh, we've we've got a good topic and lots more to to learn. Uh, particularly as we consider the resistance that's continuing to develop uh, in our in our parasite populations, um, really across the across the U.S. and frankly around the world, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. with that, Dr. Ray, thank you so much again for joining us, and we invite everybody to see us uh, same time, same place next week, where Dr. Beck is going to visit uh, about protein options and um, ways to manage the cost uh, as we look into the fall and the winter for that. So uh, we do encourage everyone to, if you have a moment, please feel, please <laughs> complete our feedback survey. Uh, hopefully if we got that done right, it should launch for you as you exit out of Zoom. If not, we've put that uh, in, the, in the chat. You can just click on that link and, and give, us, give us some thoughts there. And other, other than that, Dr. Beck, am I missing anything? No, I think that's got it. All thank right. Well, much. thank you. We will see everyone next week.